In a ruling delivered by email, Robin Knowles, the Justice of the Commercial Courts of England and Wales, upheld Nigeria's prayer on the ground that the ill-fated gas processing contract was obtained by fraud. The UK judge dismissed an earlier 6.6 .6 billion US dollar arbitral judgment against Nigeria in favor of P&ID, in which interest has been increased to 11.5 billion over an alleged failed contract to develop a gas processing plant. Judge Knowles ruled that the awards were obtained by fraud and that what had transpired in the case were contrary to public policy. Joining me to explain the case and the ruling is Barrister Evans Ufeli, constitutional lawyer. Barrister Ufeli, welcome. Yes, Would you want to summarily give our viewers the general, uh, what generally happened in the case before you even tell us the specifics of this judgment today? Yes, what happened in that case is that um, the, the PNID uh, is a company that entered into a contract with the Nigerian government for the supply of gas in Calabar. That now, fraudulent, the, one can say now that they fraudulently entered into... No, the, 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 wait, at, at the point, there was a contract. The, a contract actually existed. Okay. Uh, a, a contract actually existed. Uh, they entered into that contract for the, for the purposes uh, of building a gas plant for which um, the federal government will supply the gas and the PNID will process same based on certain terms and agreements. Okay, in the process of um, execution, uh, parties on both sides had issues and factors that militated against the success and the breakthrough of the contract. Now, because I followed this case deeply uh, when they first got the arbitral award. Now, uh, uh, since the contract failed, the federal government did not take it serious because uh, uh, it didn't come to fruition. So, they, because the arbitration clause in the agreement is that when there's a dispute, parties will subject um, whatever dispute does a fallout of the agreement to arbitration. Um, they went to that arbitration and uh, because uh, there was no follow-up from the side of the Nigerian government, uh, they got an award of so much, so much money then. And there was a public outcry that um, certain persons in Nigeria contributed to why uh, the case went the way it went and that these people now have these funds. In fact, they even threatened to Nigeria at that time that um, they will level execution against our foreign reserves. Then we still have considerably a uh, foreign reserve. Uh, they wanted to level execution against it before the Nigerian government now took it up. Okay, took it up from where they left it off and uh, went deeper. The major reason they gave at the arbitration, which became a fraud, was that the contract failed, that the Nigerian government should pay them for the money that they would have made if the contract had succeeded. Forgetting that the factors that militated against the success of the contract came from both sides. First, the gas plant was not completed. And then they were expecting the Nigerian government to supply gas into an uncompleted gas plant. Okay, so um, they didn't know, they, he that comes to equity must come with clear hands. Anything short of that is fraud. Okay, and that is what the United States uh, court have just uh, made clear to the public. You mean the, um, you mean the, the English the, and Wales court? Yes. Yes. Um, it, it, these, are, these, are, these are Irish, two Irish guys, okay? Now, the original person who initiated the contract was not even the persons who are standing now. It's the, their father. The children are the ones now pursuing this, okay? But they forget that um, the contract was not consummated. It was an incoherent contract that had fought on both the PNID side and the Nigerian side. 
the gas were never supplied. The plant was never completed built in Calabar. The uh, equity, the Nigerian equity was the gas supply. Okay, why the contribution or the or the or what they call consideration in contract of the uh, PNID was the, the was to build the plant. Now the plant was not was not completed. The gas supply was not supplied. The contract broke down. So the ruling the today, <laughs> the ruling today factored in the the two the two sides. Uh, the two sides inability to meet the obligations and ruled the uh, ruled that none of the two sides should be penalized i guess very well because uh you know in contract where you have a mutual deficiency where you have there, there, there are different kinds of uh, factors that are limited against contract which we call mistake under the law if i enter into a contract to supply you beans for example and we both agree, but while the beans was in the vessel through the sea, it got sunk. You understand? Both of us believe we have entered into a contract, but as at the time we are executing that contract, the subject matter of the contract has been consumed by the forces of nature. In that case, you cannot hold either side responsible. In some cases, you have unilateral mistake where it is one person who believes that he has entered into a contract and the other person did not understand the fact and terms of that contract. In some cases, you have a mutual mistake where uh, there, there is a, a defective or a defection from both sides. Both sides have contribution as to why the contract cannot be consummated. So in that case, parties are supposed to bear their cost. But they, they, they went on that arbitration journey and secure that uh, award, arbitral award at the, at the first time. Now, thinking that they are going to, they, they even have commenced execution, and our foreign reserve was threatened. Before they took the case up effectively, federal government to ensure that uh, the true picture of uh, what really transpired is. But, 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 from the reports uh, before uh, today's judgment, uh, there have been times when some the kind of the quality of representation that Nigeria was said to have gotten was not quite up to par. Uh, you want to briefly illuminate that? Yes, yes, because there was compromise. Uh, the, the, the first set of um, uh, persons who represented Nigeria at, 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 the, at the beginning when they got their first award, some of them were arrested by the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission and they made confessional statement to the effect that uh, uh, they, they, they compromised, uh, they went the relation of their duties and that uh, they collected gratification to foil, uh, to foil the prospect of that case in favor of um, the adverse party. And that uh, so, a, lot, a lot of conversations were made and it's on record, the EFCC have a quantum of uh, evidence and uh, uh, suspects who, who, who are, were later also tried criminally under under our laws. Well, so well, there well, is no doubt. Just, just wanting to let my viewers get a clear picture of were these Nigerians or foreigners representing Nigeria? No, they were not foreigners. At the risk of not calling names, uh, so, some of them are people who we know. Okay, who have held uh, positions uh, in in the federal level and at, at the state levels, highly placed lawyers uh, who have uh, had. Uh, is there uh, any form of is there any form of sanction that the Nigerian Bar Association could uh, visit on characters such as such as this? Of course, uh, the Nigerian Bar Association will, will level uh, that where there's an official petition to that effect. Uh, uh, you know, stating that someone has uh, breached the professional ethics, and that should come with evidence to that effect. But for now, I think it was the EFCC that investigated them. And the fact that the EFCC investigated them or prosecuted them does not mean they cannot also go under the... Uh, professional misconduct um, uh, 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 proceedings of the Nigeria Bar Association, because either way, 
uh, a crime was committed and the professional conduct was flouted, uh, the normal professional uh, uh, for which we all pride ourselves today is one that is supposed to come with a lot of dignity and respect and their patriotism. Uh, so okay, let me, let, me go, let me go further to, to probe you. This then naturally brings to mind the fact that are there mechanisms are there mechanisms to vet the quality of representation Nigeria gets when people or professionals like yourself claim to be to be representing Nigeria uh, and uh, ultimately we get to be hearing stories of compromise uh, are there mechanisms that the Ministry of Justice or the Nigerian government uh, has to, to, to kind of vet the quality of representation it gets in matters like this? Yes, the mechanism is the Ministry of Justice. The Ministry of Justice, the added by the Attorney General of the Federation, will, will review cases, uh, both cases we have within and uh, cases we have uh, uh, both international and municipal cases. It is the responsibility because uh, the, as the chief law officer of the state, his office oversees uh, those functions. Even appointment of those who represent the country and issues like this and, and all, all that. Um, it is the responsibility of the office of the attorney general to so do. And that same office is also supervised by, by, by the presidency because the presidency also have uh, um, a legal team that also advise the president apart from the uh, Attorney General of the Federation. So that is how it is. There, there are mechanisms, okay, but what we should guide against in our country is that no matter how badly ruptured our economy is or how we are painted black all over the world, uh, one thing we must not do is to sabotage what's left of our country. Uh, we must, as a matter of necessity, protect our own. Now, the, the courts uh, over there have seen that truly these judgments was procured by fraud. And uh, under our judicial system, which is uh, a type of the judicial system of the judgment we just, we just seen, one of the ways of obtaining an already procured judgment is where it is either it is obtained by fraud, okay, where someone has misled the tribunal or the arbitration uh, uh, body or the courts into believing if, that a fact exists when such does not or that a particular issue was supposed to be in a particular way it turned out to be false. Whatever judgment that springs out from there will be regarded as a, a judgment that is procured by fraud. And that is what has happened in the case under reference. Uh, the the, the, the uh, uh, arbitration couldn't have gone ahead to give room for the PRI to have a feast okay, of, that, of that award when the on, on the current issue that uh, gave birth to that award have issues of fraud and fraudulent activities underneath it then it, it will be a big blow to the court itself the uh, judge that award seem and to the international community at large and that is why thank the you very went much this way. thank you very much Mr. Feli, for the enlightenment uh, we really appreciate the fact that uh, uh, you've given us the uh, quality uh, illumination to matters such as this. We wish Nigeria right. could be a bit more, a bit more stringent in the way it, it manages uh, actions, especially actions taken against Nigeria outside the borders of Nigeria. Because for a while, we thought uh, 11.5 billion dollars in these hard times would have to be. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barista. You're welcome. Thank you. How the history of cocoa in Nigeria and mainland West Africa should challenge each of us to drive the revamping of our dwindling national fortune. My friends and business partners, with whom I value ideas, often wonder why I usually hold a somewhat pessimistic opinion of the government being able to sustainably solve the twin problems of one, endemic poverty, and two, 
the misplaced belief by the majority of our compatriots that the government, instead of a culture of value, innovation, and resilient productiveness, can eradicate poverty in our society. The throwbacks series on Coco, that is how it came to our shores from the diaspora, how cooperation democratized its wealth creation opportunity to the interland of Yoruba land, and how it became the highest source of revenue for the richest regional government or administration in pre-1966 Nigeria, this whole week will help to showcase how a nation grows from the collective wealth of its productive and philanthropic citizens. The diaspora come returning Angu, James Pinson Labula Davis, JPL Davis. James Pinson Labula Davis was born to James and Charlotte Davis in the village of Bathurst, Syria alone, then a British colony. His parents were creole of receptive the captive Yoruba ancestry, liberated by the British West African squadron from the Atlantic slave traders, whose origins were in Abe Okuta and Obomosho, respectively. Davis entered the Church Missionary Society, CMS Grammar School, now known as Syria Lone Grammar School, in Freetown in 1848. After completing his secondary education, he became a teacher with the CMS in Freetown. He later enlisted as a cadet with the British Royal Navy's West African Squadron and served on HMS Volcano under Commander Robert Coote, where he was trained in navigation and, and seamanship. Davis progressed from cadet to midshipman and eventually lieutenant. David was a lieutenant aboard HMS Bloodhound during the bombardment of Lagos under the command of Command Commander Wilmot and Commodore Henry William Bruce in 1861, in 1851, in which Oba Kosoko was ousted, resulting in the ascension of Oba Akitoe. During the bombardment, the British Navy reportedly lost two officers and ten men were wounded. Lieutenant David was among the wounded. David retired from the Navy in 1852 and offered his services as a merchant vessel captain traversing the West African coast. He eventually settled in Lagos in 1856, where he became known as Captain J.P.L. Davis. Davis is credited with pioneering cocoa farming in West Africa after obtaining the cocoa seeds from Brazilian sheep and also from the island of Fernando Po in 1879 and 1880. Davis subsequently established a prosperous cocoa farm in Ijon near the Adunion River, just outside the then colony of Lagos, now on the border of Lagos and Ogun states. Davis also helped spread cocoa farming knowledge through Jacob Kaide Coca, whose profile we will treat tomorrow. In April 1916, the Journal of African Society credited a native of Accra with introducing cocoa to mainland West Africa, but Justice W. B. Griffiths the Colonial Chief Justice of the Gold Coast, present-day Ghana, and a former late 19th century administrative headquarters of the colony and the protectorates, which became Nigeria in 1914, issued a rebuttal in the 20 June 1916 edition, crediting his father, Sir Brantford Griffiths, the British Governor of Gold Coast from 1885 to 1895, with pioneering cocoa farming in Gold Coast, noting that Davis predated his father as the cocoa pioneer in West Africa. Justice Griffith wrote, I quote, As far as I'm aware, the first person to plant cocoa on the mainland, on the mainland West Africa was the late Captain J.P.L. Davis, a well-known native of Lagos who in 1882 used to tell me about the farm he had lately just made beyond the protectorate seat of Lagos. Davis was also a close associate and friend of Bishop Samuel Ajayi Crowder. Both men collaborated on a couple of Lagos social initiatives, such as the opening of the Academy, a social and cultural center for public enlightenment. 
on 24 October 1866 with Bishop Crowder as the first patron and Davis as his first president. In 1859, Davis provided Reverend Thomas Babington Macaulay the father of the famous nationalist Abba Macaulay with the seed funding to establish CMS Grammar School, Lagos. 50 pounds, about 5 million naira today, to buy books and equipment. With the seed funds, Babington Macaulay opened CMS Grammar School on 6th of June, 1859. In 1867, Davis contributed another 100 pounds, about 10 million naira today, toward a CMS Grammar School building fund. Other contributors to the CMS building fund were non Saro, such as Taiwo Olowo, who contributed 50 pounds. Saro contributors also included men such as Moses Johnson, I.H. Willoughby, T.F. Cole, James George, and Charles Forsyth, who contributed 40 pounds. Captain Davis died at his Lagos home on 29th of August 1906 and was buried at Argele Cemetery in Lagos on the 30th of August 1906. In conclusion, either as a diasporian, returning, or just simply a value innovating entrepreneur, what will be your entrepreneurial and or philanthropic legacy? as the pioneering of cocoa plantation on the mainland of the west coast of Africa and CMS Grammar School are uh, some of JPL Davis's 190 years after his death. And that's it on the show tonight. I am Bola Oba. Have a good night.